By the way, great to have you guys online. Leave a comment. Leave a comment, but make them nice. I don't like that mean stuff. <laughs> we are in a series titled, What Does This Mean? And within Christianity, sometimes there's these issues or these words or phrases, and people hear it and go, what, what in the world is that all about? It can be a little confusing. We're trying to help bring some explanation, some understanding. My hope and my prayer is that this is instructive, but I'm also hoping and praying that this is helpful for people. So, as a part of this series, what does this mean? Last week and today, we're talking about the subject of eschatology. Big, fancy word. Eschatology just means the study of last things. Sometimes you'll hear this referred to as end times theology or, or last days theology. Last week we talked about probably the key event when it comes to the end times. And that's the second coming of Jesus. If you didn't get a chance to hear that, it's available online. Go to our church website or our church Facebook page and you can check that out. I think it might help you to tie in with some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. Today we're going to talk about another aspect of eschatology that is much debated. And it's, it's called, in a broad sense, the millennium. The millennium. How many people, by the way, just out of curiosity, have ever heard that before? Raise your hands. Pretty good. Okay. Really good. Um, there is a period of a thousand years, and, and the word millennium literally means one thousand years, that uh, is referred to in the book of Revelation chapter 20. And really there are three major views when it comes to this thing of the millennium. Um, but even among those who hold each of these views, there's differences and debate. And one of the views, premillennialism, some people divide into two different views, so that makes four instead of three. But I'm trying desperately to keep this simple and understandable. Yes? yes. We're going to try. Uh, at 9 o'clock, I saw a few eyes blazing over, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. Uh, and and uh, so we're going to give a, a simple description of these three views and say a few other things about them. But I think to start, what would be helpful is to go to the book of Revelation, chapter 20, where we find the reference to this thousand years. This is a really, really rich passage filled with things. We want to look at, though, I'm reading it for the purpose of you seeing in its context this reference to this thousand year period. While you're turning there, uh, the book of Revelation is something, it's indicating to us that something that was revealed, re revelation, revealed. And it was revealed, this vision to John the Apostle by the Lord, and then he provides this to us. And in this revelation, part of it, uh, in, in chapter 20, John talks about this, mentions this 1,000 year period. So Revelation chapter 20, and I'm going to start at verse 1. Don't get too worried about everything that's referred to in here. We just want, we just want to see this thousand year thing right now for today. John, uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. If you haven't, say yes. 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 So John says here, Then I saw, in other words, he's told us about, there was this and there was that, and then, so we're coming in, in the middle of, a, of this revelation, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. He sees the dragon, that old serpent who is the devil, Satan. Fortunately, there he tells us exactly what the symbol is. It's Satan. He sees Satan bound him in chains for, what is it? A thousand years. There it is. We're going to read some more. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and locked, so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. Afterward, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and the people sitting on them had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who'd been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus and for proclaiming the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor accepted his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They all came to life again, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is that thousand year, that's the millennium. This is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years had ended. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them, the second death holds no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him 
a thousand years. I'm going to read a little bit more. When the thousand years came to an end, Satan will be let out of his prison. He will go to the, deceive the nations called Gog and Magog in every corner of the earth. He will gather them together for battle, a mighty army as numberless as sand along the seashore. And I saw them as they went up to the broad plain of the earth and surrounded God's people and the beloved city. But fire from heaven came down on the attacking armies and consumed them. Then the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You say, Dan, I'm very confused right now. <laughs> I know. Don't worry about all of that for today. We're just going to hone in on this thousand year period today. Like I said, there are basically, in its simplest understanding, three views when it comes to the millennium. There's one position is amillennialism, another is premillennialism, and another is postmillennialism. Amillennial, premillennial, postmillennial, millennial. These positions have their names based on the second coming, the main event of eschatology of end times. So how, how the timing of it happens with the millennium and the second coming is sort of how they get their names. I'm going to take those three positions. I'm not taking them in any special order, just the way that I uh, presented them. And I'll try to give a, a brief explanation of each of them. First, amillennial. Um, that a prefix, that means no. So uh, amillennial is like there's no millennium, but actually many people who defend amillennialism say there is a millennium, so it's kind of a misnomer, but in the amillennial view, the millennium is currently happening. When Jesus ascended into heaven, that began the clock, and it's happening right now, and in the amillennial position, what we're waiting for is the second coming of Jesus. Everybody, by the way, all these positions agree on that. There's a little bit of agreement. And it's they all agree Jesus is coming. Yes? yes. Yeah, he is coming. So uh, in the amillennial view, the understanding of the thousand years is that it's not literal. In fact, in all of these positions, there are people who would hold that the thousand years isn't necessarily a literal thousand years. On this view, since we're in the millennial period right now, again, when Jesus comes back, that's it. There's the judgment of believers and unbelievers. Unbelievers will face judgment and eternal condemnation. Believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to hear and receive their final reward. And it's, it's, it's eternity then. Believers, eternity separated from God in hell. Unbelievers with the Lord forever. One of the things that's nice about this view is it's relatively simple. I've got some slides. I don't know if you guys got uh, those sheets when you came in or not. I don't, I don't think there was enough of them. But um, I think sometimes it helps to see a little visual representation. So in the amillennial position, by the way, um, those slides, if you're watching online, we put them on the Facebook page, and then Nadia will also put them along with this talk uh, when it's posted on the church website. So these slides that I'm referring to, um, will, are available online as well. But that dotted line is basically like uh, the movement of time through history. And uh, again, on this view, the, we're in the millennium. It's happening. And at some point, we don't know when, all the views agree with this, nobody knows when, the second coming will happen. And you'll have judgment and eternity. <coughs> Fairly simple. Yes? Yes. Okay. Another view, the second position, is premillennialism. The word pre means before. So, in the premillennial view, the idea is that Jesus will return before the millennium. Premillennial. The second coming of Jesus happens before this thousand year period. In the premillennial view, a time called the tribulation plays an important role in the doctrine as well. And there's differences of opinion regarding the tribulation, as you might guess. I'm leaving out so many details because I'm trying desperately to keep this simple. But but uh, the tribulation is a time of great suffering and, and 
How and when the tribulation happens in association with the second coming is also an issue that's debated. Is the second coming before the tribulation? Or is the second coming after this tribulation? Or is it maybe even in the middle of the tribulation? <laughs> We had a friend who he would say, "How you doing? My name is Joe. I'm a pre, I'm a mid-trib pre-millennial." I didn't even know what he was talking about. Um, uh, these are questions. This tribulation and how that happens, the timing of that. Also, there's a debate and discussion among those who hold the premillennial view regarding the rapture. Um, that's a doctrine based on First Thessalonians chapter four and Luke chapter seventeen and others. And in the rapture, the teaching is that believers will be caught up to meet Jesus in the air, including the believers who've died already. They'll be caught up with Jesus into the air. And so when Jesus comes to earth, they will be with him. and They will rule with Christ. This can get complicated. Again, I'm leaving out details because I'm trying. Is it, are you following so far? Are you with me? Yes. No, he's saying yes. <laughs> Hello, are you with me? These guys are all asleep. Please, please. <laughs> Uh, it gets complicated, I know. In a very simple, basic way, the premillennial view holds that the second coming will happen, and then this thousand-year period. During this thousand-year period, on the premillennial view, Jesus will actually be physically present here on earth. He will be the king over all the earth during that thousand years. He will reign with his believers Again, those who had already died and those who were alive when he came, they will be alive on earth with him and they will reign with Christ for a thousand years. Satan will be bound during this time. He will be cast into the bottomless pit. He will have no influence on this earth. That would be nice, wouldn't it? That sounds pretty good. And uh, at the end then of the thousand years, Satan will be released for a time. Uh, he will join forces with unbelievers, but that they will be soundly defeated for once and for all. And then all the unbelievers who died throughout history will be raised from the dead and they will stand before the Lord. We will have judgment day. Believers receive eternal punishment. Or excuse me, unbelievers, eternal punishment. Believers receive eternal reward. All right. There's one more. <laughs> How you doing? Are you okay? All right. There's one more. Here, here's the timeline that I, uh, here's the timeline of the premillennial position. So on this one, pre-millennial, pre-thousand years, the second coming is first. You got the tribulation. It could be that the second coming is before or after or mid-trib. Then you'll have the rapture. Uh, the saints come back with Jesus. They reign for the thousand-year period. After that, Satan is released. And um, there's a battle, but he's defeated. And then we have judgment and eternity. Again, the simple, that's the simple version of all of this. All right. One more. Post-millennial. Post-millennial. Thousand years. The second coming is after the thousand years. Post. Okay. One of the books that I used this week said this. While post-millennialism is not widely held at present, it has had a rather significant influence within the church during long periods of its history, and within the last 100 years, it has been the dominant position. End of quote. I didn't know that. Um, and and I, I'm reading that to you not to make a, a, an appeal for this position. I'm, I'm reading it just so you can see throughout history, these different views have shifted and some have been more popular at times than others. The popularity of the view isn't what makes it correct. Um, but so anyhow, in the post-millennial view, the second coming of Jesus will be after post the thousand years. This thousand years will happen, then Jesus will come, the second coming, and then basically judgment and eternity. It's very similar in many ways to the amillennial position. In fact, the charts are virtually identical. Um, one of the resources that I used this week was a book that I read years ago that provides all the different positions. And I'm going to quote to you from the scholar who, who defended the post-millennial position because he lays it out in, in, I think, a pretty good and understandable way. So here's, here's how he would explain the post-millennial view. Quote, post-millennialism expects the proclaiming of the spirit-blessed gospel of Jesus Christ to win the vast majority of human beings to salvation in the present age. It's a very, very optimistic view. 
<clears throat> Increasing gospel success will gradually produce a time in history prior to Christ's return in which faith and righteousness and peace and prosperity will prevail in the affairs of people and nations. After an extensive area, era, not necessarily literally a thousand years, of such conditions, the Lord will return visibly, bodily, and in great glory, ending history with the general resurrection, the great judgment of all humankind. Hence, our system is post-millennial and that the Lord's glorious return occurs after an era of millennial conditions. So here's a slide of the post-millennial. And again, it's, the slide is the same, even though amillennialism and post-millennialism would be understood differently. Some of it maybe is semantics, but the millennium happens and then the second coming. One of the interesting things about the post-millennial view, it's not on the slide there, but in the post-millennial view, there isn't really a clear beginning point of the millennium. Like it won't be the kind of thing that people will go, well, the millennium has started, it's obviously started now. In fact, one of the writers uh, that I read this week, one of the scholars said that in the post-millennial view, the millennium will arrive by degrees. And again, it's, it's not a literal thousand years in this view. So what happens, there's a, a tremendous turning to Christ. Uh, and um, then the second coming, judgment, and eternity. So do you have a basic gist? Are you doing okay? Is it kind of understandable? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Basic, here's the basic gist. I'm millennial. The millennium is happening right now, and we're waiting for the second coming. Premillennial, the second coming has to happen first, then the millennium. Postmillennial, the millennium will come, Gradually, then the second coming. In, in, a, in a real simple sense, they're, they're in a basic sense, they're fairly simple. Now, you're probably hearing all this and you're saying, okay, okay, that's nice, that's good. <laughs> all right, Dan. Which of these three views is the right one? Tell us that. And my answer to that is, I don't know. And I'm not being cute, and I'm not trying to be funny, and I'm not trying to dodge the issue. I've thought and I've prayed about this. I've read defenses of each one of these positions. I mean, very honestly, I don't know which one of these positions is the correct one. And by the way, we didn't even begin to cover all the details of each position because I'm trying to keep it somewhat simple. But I will also say this to you. I don't know which of these positions is the right one. But to me, that has never been the fundamental issue when it comes to end times. That's not the fundamental issue anyhow. The fundamental issue is this, knowing Jesus. Because on all of these views, no matter which one of these views you might adopt or don't adopt, he is coming on all of these views. That's clear from the Bible. Listen to last week's message if you're not, if you're not certain about it. He is coming for sure. And the way that you're ready for his coming is you're walking with Jesus. You know him. He could come at any time, and you want to be saved. You want, you want to say, "My, I have looked to Jesus for forgiveness of sins, and I have put my faith and my trust in him. Not a church, not a pastor, not some denomination. I'm trusting in Jesus. Let me offer a couple of points about this millennial thing. First, this is my opinion. This is not a biblical absolute. This is one guy's opinion. My opinion is that a person's view regarding the millennium should not be a cause for division or for breaking fellowship. I don't think that should cause it. And, and by the way, it has done that in the past. I don't think it should. I believe this is an area in which Christians can agree to disagree. We can do that here. In one of the books that I read this week regarding the millennium, the author wrote explaining each of the positions, and he leaned towards the premillennial position, but he wrote this, and I appreciated it so much. He wrote this quote about these various positions. As important as it is to understand the points of difference, we must not lose sight of the great basic truth on which we all agree. The Lord is returning. We must make this 
central. End of quote. I agree. That's the deal. That, that's the main point. Are you trusting in Jesus? Uh, this is an area, uh, he quoted this old writer, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but um, this, is like to the, this is like advice to the church, a word to the church. In essential matters, let's have unity. In doubtful matters, let's allow for liberty. And in all things, let's be charitable towards each other. That's a good way of, of saying it and thinking about it. So this is, in my opinion, an area in which we can agree to disagree. Number two, I think it's helpful to know, too, that in all of these views, now the, the post-millennial view is very optimistic, but even in that view, this would be true. This is still true in all of these views. There's going to be trouble and problems and hardship and pain and grief in this world. You know that, right? Most of us here are not children. You've lived some life. Have you had some grief in your life already? I'll bet you have. Yeah. Have you had some troubles and some hardships along the way? Yeah. That's part of life on earth. We, you know, when I've talked to people about this end time stuff before, I get the feeling that people are looking for, like, which view allows us to escape trouble and problems and hurt and difficulty? And here's the answer. We're not going to escape those things. Uh, Jesus said this. This is in Matthew chapter 16. This is what, this is what our Lord said. The Lord told us this. Chris actually referred to it this morning in his prayer. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. You're going to have troubles. It's just, it's the nature of, it's reality here on earth. But Jesus did go on to say, he said that, and then the very next thing he said was, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. But understand something. You, you want to be an overcomer? Say yes. yes. I want to be an overcomer too. That's not found in your view on the millennium. Your, your, your ability to be an overcomer happens in Jesus himself. What he offers us to overcome is himself, is Jesus. Jesus doesn't say, if you have the right theological position regarding the end times, I will help you handle trials and sorrows and troubles. He doesn't say that. He says, take heart. These are his words. Take heart. I, Jesus, I have overcome the world. If you want to be an overcomer, you have to walk with Jesus. You have to know Jesus. That's the way. If you want to be ready for the second coming, however it happens, you want to be ready, say yes. yes. You want to be trusting in Jesus. That's the answer. You and I cannot escape the problems and the troubles and the grief of this world, but according to the Bible, we can walk with Jesus and have a relationship with Jesus. This is possible. This is not a fantasy. We, we can have a relationship with Jesus that would allow us to have peace in the midst of difficulties. That's what the Bible promises. We can experience, again, this is the Bible, we can experience joy, in fact, the joy of the Lord in spite of our circumstances. By the way, I'm curious. Is that true for you? Are there people here who could say, I was going through something very, very difficult, but I was still able to experience the joy of the Lord. Could you say that? I'm seeing some people nodding their heads, yes. yes. Yeah. That's not a fantasy. The Bible promises that. So our hope is not the best end times theology. Our hope is Jesus. Always. Always has been. Always will be. Amen? Amen. Okay. That's the short version of the sermon, because I shortened the sermon. Believe me, that's, I know, and you're saying, what? Yeah, that's the short version, because I came to the end of this week, and some things were happening in our world. And I'm like, what is going on here? And I prayed a lot about this, and I thought a lot about this, and I looked through scriptures, and, and um, something historical is happening in our world right now. It's a very big deal. <clears throat> But the question I had is, you know, as Christians, as believers, what should we be thinking? How should we be responding in light of these events that are happening right now, today, right now, in, in Ukraine and with Russia? Uh, and the other thing, because I've been dealing with this end time stuff, 
and I actually got a couple of texts about this, is this war that's happening right now? Is this fulfilling end time prophecies? I was asked about that. I don't think it is. Now I say that with great humility because we don't God hasn't provided us all the details on this. I don't think the Russia Ukraine war, like I don't think you can go to the book of Ezekiel and go, see what it says there? That's referring to the Russia Ukraine war. I don't think that's happening. Matter of fact, Jesus told us this. You probably heard this, but I'll say it. Jesus told us, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. You know what he says next? You're going to hear about wars and rumors of wars. You know what his very next words are? But don't panic. That's his very next words. Don't panic. He says, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Matthew 24, 7. In other words... Every time a war breaks out somewhere in the world, even if it's a war involving Russia, and some people believe that that's going to really play a major role in the end times, but that's not an indication, as Jesus put it, that the end is now immediately following. Hey, friends, ever since Jesus ascended back into heaven, there have been wars on planet Earth. There's almost never a time when there isn't a war. This is not something new. It's horrible. I'm not diminishing the significance of it. I already told you it's very significant. It's a terrible thing. I'm just saying, not that it's a small thing. I'm just saying it doesn't appear to me, I'm trying to be humble, but it doesn't to me, appear to me that this event is fulfilling a specific biblical prophecy regarding end times. I don't think that's what's happening with this. By the way, why are we provided with these end time prophecies in the Bible? Why would God give us this information? Why does he give this to us? Let me give you a few reasons. This is probably not all of them, but we know from Scripture some of the reasons why. We're provided with this to keep us from being deceived. We're provided with this information to encourage us to remain faithful to the Lord Jesus. Stay faithful to him. Number three, we're, we're given this information to remind us that God is in control. When God talks about something and then thousands of years later it happens, we kind of go, oh yeah, that's right. He's in control. We're providing this information, number four, to remind us to always be ready for his coming. And the passages that deal with the second coming, it's almost always they're saying, be ready, be ready. And number five, we're provided with this to prompt us to encourage each other to put our hope in the Lord. So with that in mind, here we are, the church. We got some crazy stuff going on in our world right now. What should we do? Let me give you four things. Number one, remain faithful to the Lord Jesus. Please, please don't walk away from the Lord. But, and by the way, he's victorious. Not he will be or he might be. He is already. And those of us who put our faith and trust in him, is that you? We are going to be victorious with him. Is that pretty good news? I like the idea of victory. I want to be victorious. Knowing Jesus and walking faithfully with him, that's how we will be found ready when he comes. That's the central factor. Have you put your faith in Jesus? Yes. Please, please. Yes, yes. That's the first one. Number two, don't be afraid. Over and over in the scriptures, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And what I mean here is nothing is happening. Nothing is happening here on planet Earth, nothing is happening anywhere in the universe that is a surprise to God. God wasn't surprised by this Russia-Ukraine thing. Didn't catch him off guard. I heard some commentators this week say, man, Putin, the way he moved, we're kind of surprised that he was so... God wasn't surprised in the least. Before Putin was ever born, God knew that he was going to be pulling this nonsense. He knew that he was going to be doing this. So nothing is happening outside of God's control. And by the way, God is, doing, is bringing about his purposes. You say, I don't see it, Dan. He's bringing about his purposes. God's kingdom is advancing, and it will prevail. Number three, for us in the church, we need to be the people with God's help. We can't do it on our own. We need to be the people who are the source of hope and encouragement to others 
not the source of worry and fear and anxiety. All of us know people who can walk in the room, and the minute they walk in the room, they bring fear with them, they bring trouble, they bring anxiety with them. That's not who we're called to be. That's not our calling. We're, we're the church. When we walk in the room, the light of Jesus needs to be coming into the room. Hope and encouragement that we have because of him needs to be coming into the room. Do you have... Do, let me ask you something. Do you have hope in Jesus? Yes. yes. Do you really? Yes. You ought to be giving that to others. You ought to be sharing that. The church needs to step up. Some of us have been doing playing a weak game of church for too long. Mm -hmm. And we need to step up now. I'll let God determine who needs to hear that. Um, but we need to bring his light to others. And then the other thing we can do, obviously, is pray. Some people think, oh, well, God, pray. That's kind of a smaller thing. That's an important thing. We need to pray for the people of Ukraine. Really, we need to pray for the people of Russia. We need to pray for them. Many of them, I think, probably don't even agree with this. They're just caught in the middle. We need to pray for, like, the leaders in Europe and all the leaders in the world. We need to pray for President Biden. Whatever your politics are, you need to pray for President Biden and all the leaders in our country. We need to pray that the gospel will advance. Russia, Ukraine, they'll be gone someday. I hate to say this, but I'll say it anyhow. The United States will be gone someday. There is one kingdom alone that will, prevail, that will prevail forever, and that's God's kingdom. Our first allegiance is there. Our desire, our hope, our lives ought to be geared towards helping people come into his kingdom. Yes? Yes. So, I'm going to invite you to do something. I know everybody isn't comfortable with this kind of thing, but... If you're comfortable doing this, I'd like to invite you to come up. If you want to stand, please, we're going to have a closing prayer. And if you can come up and join me in the front and just as a, uh, join me as a, uh, a, a gesture of agreement, as a gesture of support as we pray together, I'd like to invite you to do that. Not everybody has to. I understand not everybody's comfortable with these kinds of things, but if you will come, we're going to pray together as a church. <laughs> At 9 o'clock, people were putting their hands on each other. If you're not comfortable, and I understand you don't have to do that, but, uh, you know, the Bible does talk about the laying on of hands. I love saying this, by the way. I, it's just, it just does my heart good. Mm. Jesus Christ is Lord, and he is the victor. Yes? yes. Yeah. Bow your heads and pray with me. Lord Jesus, it just, we, we need you. There's times, we, that's always true, but there's just these times in life, there's these times in history where that sort of becomes more apparent to us, and that's really apparent to us right now. And I pray, Lord, that we would remain resolute, remain faithful to you. Holy Spirit, help us. We need you. Let everybody here in this place be faithful to you and to your kingdom, Lord. We pray for the people of Ukraine. I can't even imagine. I saw images this morning of babies who had just been born and they were like in a subway or someplace. I just, what? What in the world? It's just mind-blowing. Help them, Lord. There, we know, Lord, that there are believers there right now. There's, the church is there. And we pray that you protect them and watch over them. Everybody, but we're, we're thinking of the church too, Lord. Um, we pray for the people of Russia. I believe many of those people, I don't know, but I, I, there's probably a lot of them. They're just regular people. They don't want a war. They don't want this fight. And these leaders of governments just get crazy. Um, we pray for 
uh, the leaders of these countries in Europe, but all around the world. I, I know the president of China is on everybody's mind. Now what's he going to do? Restra if there's evil on his mind, restrain that evil, we pray, Lord Jesus. We pray, Lord, for our president, President Biden, and the people that advise him and the leaders in our country, give them wisdom. May they be open to your wisdom. May they seek and desire your wisdom and act in accordance with your wisdom, Lord. Um, Lord, I thank you for these people here. I know all over the world your church is on the move and at work. I just experienced this local congregation. Bless them, Lord. Let us be your light. People need right now, desperately need, hope and encouragement. I pray that you would use this group of people that's right here, right now, and the people who are listening online, use us to be that source of hope and encouragement. You're the ultimate source, Lord, of course. It comes from you, but work through us. Let us be your people. May the kingdom advance, Lord Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you, love.